Staying with the World Chess Championship just for a second, in a parallel universe, you qualify for a World Championship match and you're facing Magnus. Mm -hmm. How does that match play out? Um, I, you know, I really, I really don't know because, it, because, and this is, again, I have to say this is the best part about being a streamer and, and having that as my main job, I can say all these things that I, I would never say in the past. Um, but for the candidates, I did preparation, but it was not like I'm looking at the Berlin nonstop. In fact, I mean, I'll, I'll tell a story. So like I lost the game to Timor in this, uh, this, this, this whole night BD2, A4, a4 Spanish. And, and like, I remember looking at this very briefly in, in Colorado as far as doing my training camp. And we looked at it for maybe like 10 minutes, looked at some of these, some of these other orders like queen e2, queen c2, h3. And we didn't look at this very obvious order that he played in the game. And I just looked at it. We looked at it for like 20 minutes and that was it. And it's like, okay, this is, this isn't much. And then you move on to something else. So I don't know. I mean, in my mind, I feel like if I, if, if I did that in any opening in a world championship match, that would be, I, I would probably get punished for that in, in a different way than, than in the candidates. Um, so I probably would study a lot more. Again, I don't really know how it would go because I feel like with Magnus, I, I, I feel that what I'm able to do against other players is somehow what Magnus does against everybody. And then when I try to do against Magnus, it just doesn't work. And so I feel like I need to get a high volume of games. And I feel like in the Meltwater tournament, Towards the end, the reason I did so well against him in the grand finals because I'd been playing him every month nonstop for like five, six months. And so getting familiar with his style really helped me. But then like there are these long periods where I just don't play against him and I just sort of revert to figuring out what I think works against other players. And then when I do it against Magnus, I get into some end game and he, he just cheeses me nonstop. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, think I, I think if I was really serious about it and having the mindset that I have now, I, I would do a lot better. But it's... You won't, we'll, we'll never know, most likely. Speaking of that match, you, you played 24 games. Is that correct against Magnus in, at the end of 2020? I think it was like um, seven was, matches? Yeah, seven of matches games. of four. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that was like super close. That was going down to the wire. Was that like very motivating or get, did it build your confidence or the fact that you were close but didn't quite make it at the end? Was that very disappointing? Um, I mean, I was very disappointed that I lost this uh, second blitz game in the English. I mean, it was very disappointing because, like, I looked at the line, I got the right position, and then at that one critical moment, I didn't play the right line. Um, so it was very disheartening in a way. But I think the thing is, throughout the tour, just being competitive with him, I felt good. I mean, the problem is, like, traditionally when I play him, it's like, in the last probably five, six years, I play him like every three months or something. It's usually like one game, two games max. So it's like you play the one game. If I play him the one game with white, I get some chances, but I miss something as draw. It's okay, it's a draw. But then of course I get black against him three months later, I lose the game. There's no, there's no momentum. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, there's no like carryover. And I, I really do feel like when I played him um, in the Lindoris Abbey event specifically where I, I beat him in um, in the Armageddon of that of that match, it really gave me confidence in the final. I just felt like I was playing good chess throughout. I just it, I felt like I wasn't playing against Magnus. I felt like there was none of the psychological stuff that normally is going on when I play against him. So, I mean, if I can get the volume of games, I feel like I have chances. But if I don't get that volume, I feel like somehow I revert to doing the stuff that I do against everybody else, and it's not good enough against him. We touched upon an interesting subject um, a few minutes ago about players at around the 2700 level, especially American players. We were discussing Sevian, Jeffrey Shong, uh, Sam Shanklin comes to mind as well. And they all have very different approaches as to what tournaments they play. I remember Jeffrey was playing a lot of open tournaments. I was seeing him in these random events in Texas, and he was already 2,700. Sevian, not so much. Shanklin, not at all. What is uh, the best way to make that push from 27 to like 2,750, where you surely will get some invitations? But at 2,700, you don't get as many invitations in in the big yeah, I mean, the best way is to like be the number one U.S. player, or the number one Italian player. That's the best <laughs> way. just get the invitations by being the number one player in your country. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's very tough. Uh, certainly for the American players, it's very hard because players look because the organizers look at the rating list and they generally invite by uh, from from the highest going down the list. Um, you know, I think uh, everybody has a different style. I think when I look at someone like Sevin, he's a player who strikes me as somebody who could just mow down a bunch of 2600s. His, his opening repertoire, he tends to play a lot of very sharp, dynamic lines. Um, Sam, I feel, is a little bit too... Um, He's too professional. I think he's somebody who's worked a lot with other top players. He's, he's worked with me. He's worked with Magnus. And what works at the top level is sort of being stable and picking off players here or there in preparation. Uh, the 2700 level, sort of getting to 2750, I think it's all about being able to beat like the 2600s, 2650s uh, more consistently than, than you draw them. So 
I feel like somehow you have to have that that style of, of a player like Sevian or, or like using a current junior, somebody like Noter back. You really have to have that style um, in order to keep the rating going and not start like stabilizing uh, before you get there. And I feel like for Shanklin, he, he sort of his repertoire is too stable. He's going to do well in, in closed tournaments, but if he plays the open events, he's just going to draw too many 2600s. He's going to lose points here or there, and then he's never going to get 2750. So I think you sort of have to be, in, unless you have, um, unless you're able to just get those invites to the elite events, you have to be able to to win the open tournaments. You have to have that style. Even Wesley So, for example, he just got to 2700 off of winning opens. His style was very, very different from the style that he plays today. And I think it was very similar to you as well. Yeah, you were playing a lot when you were making yeah. that push. Yeah, I was playing a huge amount, like 120 games a year or something like that. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the practice is really good. But actually, it's interesting with like Sam, with Sevian, because I, I mean, all these players are very, very close in terms of their general quality of play. But I feel like he does have those like clutch moments. He's mm. very good in those like clutch moments. And I feel like, like for example, Sam Shanklin, he's, he's an amazing player. But in those like clutch last second decisions when you have like a 50 50 choice and sometimes i like, think it's, it's happened to all of us right where you you feel like one move is is really important the other move but you're not sure which one is, is going to be right and then some players just make the right move and some players make the wrong move and sort, sort of like by instinct right and i feel like sevian he does have those instincts and those like crucial last second decisions he does do that well, very well yeah i mean from my experience playing like if we're talking about shanklin zhang and sevian specifically what I would say is Seven is the only player who, like, he will blow me off the board here or there. Like, I feel like whenever I play Shanklin, I never really am afraid of, like, losing the game. I, I mean, I'll, I'll draw plenty of games. You know, if I do something stupid like I did in the Rapid and Blitz, of course, I'll get punished. But generally, I don't feel like I'm, I'm going to lose games to him. And the same applies to Jeffrey as well. I feel like when I play them, there are never these moments where I feel like they just like they can just blow me off the board once they get that advantage. And from playing Seven and like the, the Rapid Chess Championship, playing him in Blitz in the past, there are moments that I feel like if I do something wrong, he's just going to kill me. He's just going to blow me completely off the board. So, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, it's intuition just being being really clutch at certain moments. Um, that that is a difference. I mean, I can't like again. I don't think there's any huge difference between someone who's like twenty seven thirty and somebody who's like twenty seven hundred. I think it's just it's making like slightly better decisions, controlling the risk a little bit more, so that you don't you don't end up in like losing positions as often or, or positions that where you can lose. Uh, so it's very, very minimal, though. With Jeffrey, I, I sometimes feel like he does have those things where he just blows someone off the board, where he can like play a pretty much flawless game. I mean, and and he does have that experience like playing matches against top players and occasionally beating top players in matches. Um, but yeah, maybe with like with Sam Shankland, he he's already so so established as like mm -hmm. a, a general like let's say top fifty player. And he's so used to that role that maybe he doesn't have like the youthful optimism that the other guys, the younger guys, have. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're you're actually right. I mean, I feel like there were there was a time when I played Jeffrey, and I felt like that was true. Maybe like two three years ago, I I, I remember I played him in like the last round. I think it was a title Tuesday. It was one of these uh, anti anti uh, night or one of these Bishop B five check games. And I, I think I just got blown away when I when I did something wrong. That sort of made me think like, whoa, maybe maybe he does actually have that it factor. But you know, there, there's a there's a good Twitch meme which is a uh, pog you, um, which is like oh really kind of thing. And I, I will say that. I feel like when I played him in recent times, I always feel like he's just he's always happy to get the draw. It doesn't matter what the position is, but I feel like he's always happy to just get that draw. And I think that that is definitely a, a big, big downside. Who's the next uh, big superstar in American chess? So you're talking about like young, really young, stuff? just American players. Um, yes. Right. Young, but I mean, young you're, you're, you're talking players. about like, like the Mishra up and coming, about, up, up and coming. coming. Yeah. Um, who do I think has the potential to break through? I mean, Mishra is obviously very strong at a very young age but again you have to be very careful because at those ages anything can happen they can just keep shooting up they can also slow down completely it could come to college yeah i mean m many different things can happen um you mean someone who's gonna be like 2750 or someone who i think would be like the world champion 2750 20 i would say top five in the world top five in the world um I don't know if I think any of the, the current <laughs> ones are going to get to top five in the world, if I'm being honest. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel like in the next like year or so, there's probably going to be there's probably going to be some. Actually, wait, no, there's some. No, there is a junior who I was very impressed by. Um, 
What's his name? Who does he work with? I, I remember he works with Avruch. Like, yeah, is the guy that works. There was with some Avruch. kid who had a really good result recently that I was very impressed by in the last like six months. Uh, I feel like he gained like a hundred, hundred points or something and something. I'm going to go something, something, something. Yeah, but uh, was it was it like a U.S. junior or was it? There was some kid who's, whose U.S. save is really really high right now. It's like tw- it's like twenty five or twenty five fifty. And I was very impressed by his games. I can't recall the name right off, but it was very impressive. So that's the guy. All right. Yeah. I, feel I mean, like if, you look at, him, if you look at the top uh, list under 18, his, his name's going to be like in the top top 10 uh, for sure. We're doing but I was very impressed by his games. We need a Jamie, like in a Joe Rogan experience. <laughs> Google it, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> but he's like, he's in the top 10 in, in like under 18, I think for sure at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So that's the one. Well, Hikaru, um, any questions you have for us? Questions for you guys? Um I, I guess if I if I ask a question like how are you enjoying this process of of creating a podcast because for me all of this sort of content creation at this point like it's I've been there done that so like sometimes like I'm curious like how are you guys enjoying it like are you are you enjoying it at all are you not enjoying it is it like more work than you thought it's it's definitely a lot of work but we really enjoy also hearing from people who like you've given a million interviews and Yasser has given a million interviews but sometimes you get some like little nuggets that haven't been said before mm-hmm. or some story from you know from someone's past and and we heard about your childhood I, I don't think you've spoken so much about that in the past um so yeah hearing a lot of stories from different chess players is very interesting uh and yeah we hope that it's you know it's also a good product for people yeah no i, th- I think i mean from what i've heard at least people are enjoying it. and i I have to say, like, I, I at times, I mean, I'm a little envious when I like see people. You, you get to those like 1,000, 1,000 mm. uh, subscribers. You get monetized. All these things, like being at the start of that journey. Like sometimes, sometimes I miss that because there's there's really nothing. There's no like downside to it as long as you go into it with like the right motivation. You're, it's not just like you're not thinking, okay, well, I started. I'm gonna have like a hundred thousand subscribers in like one month, something like that. If you go into it with the right like motivations and you're not expecting that success, I mean, just I, I wish sometimes I could go back to those days because everything was in some ways more fun when you the unknown of, of what you're doing as opposed to being more about like maintaining everything i think that's a big one the unknown because for me uh, i get bored extremely easily and i always try to find ways to um well diversify my portfolio and learn new things and uh, just putting the podcast together from a technical perspective, you're learning so many uh, new things, uh, learning how to use uh, YouTube, learning how to use uh, Spotify as a content creator. For example, there are so many uh, little nuggets that kind of fuel that creativity. And that yeah, basically you know, I drives also, me, I guess. You know, I was all, I'll, also this didn't come up, but I, I would say one of the things like with streaming for me is I do feel like based off the experience I've had, I think I could probably work in probably three or four other fields uh, because of those experiences. Um, and that's something that I could not have done before. So I, I, I would say that I think that's that's a huge, huge benef- beneficial thing for down the road, because even if something like the podcast doesn't lead anywhere, you still gain valuable skills for potentially other other careers as well. Before we sign off, any uh, anything else you want to add? Any thoughts, uh, words for your fans out there? What's next for you, Hikaru? Um, you know, I just I just keep going at it every day, trying to create a product that people like. Um, you know, I, I'm really proud that I'm able to do so much coverage of events, whether I plan it or whether I'm just doing commentary. And I think all this stuff is very, very good for the chess world in the long term. And I'm just really glad that everybody enjoys it. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the, the fans are the ones who basically make or break you. And uh, it's just it's, it's amazing to see there's so much support, both for myself, but also honestly for the entire chess community, both uh, in in real life and also online you know i think when i look back at it i think none of us whether it's myself whether it's uh people like the chess bras or or the botezes i I don't think any of any of us could have imagined where it's all gone and and i'm hopeful that even even for top players now there's there's more publicity even even for people like fabiano i think uh you know just I, i i think i speak for everyone actually when we talk about your commentary you did on the world championship match that was like really really good a lot of people Thank really you. enjoyed it Appreciate and that. um it's it's just great to see that that uh, chess is is doing so well well hikaru thanks a lot for joining us and i'm sure we'll hopefully see you again on the pod appreciate it absolutely thank you hikaru